Who can save us from our sin? He is our hope, our righteousness. Jesus, only Jesus. Who can make the blind to see? Who holds the keys that set us free? He paid it all to bring us peace. Jesus, only Jesus. Holy King, Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore. I join with them and bow before Jesus. Only Jesus, who can command the highest praise, who has the name above all names, you stand alone, I stand amazed, Jesus, only Jesus, holy King Almighty. Jesus, only Jesus, holy King, Almighty Lord, saints and angels all adore, I'll join with them and bow before Jesus, only Jesus, holy Only Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus, Jesus, only Jesus. And now I turn my mic on. Good morning, welcome to Twickenham. Glad to have you this morning. Thanks for coming out to be with us. Our, our regular, normal worship leader, Lincoln Smith, is not here today, so we have an irregular, abnormal worship leader today, <laughs> Dr. Cade Smith. We're glad he's here. Lincoln and Amy are actually in Louisville. Their son is getting, today, isn't it? Their, their, their son is getting married today. And we were like, dude, you got a job. But he was like, I got to go do this. So that's where he is, so. Steve Krieger, our other senior minister, is out of town today, too, so it's just me. What do y'all want to do? <laughs> like, I'm the boss. We can do anything we want. I mentioned that to, to one of our older members, and he said, well, let's just call off church and go to lunch. So, <laughs> amen. So, no, we're going to stick around for about an hour here. Hey, if you're a guest, I hope you realize we try real hard not to take ourselves too seriously, but we do want to take life and the Lord seriously. So really glad you're here. There's a card on the seat in front of you. You can fill that out, put it in the collection plate when it passes in just a minute, and let us know if there's anything we can do to help you. Just glad you're here. Hey, let's stand. Let me share a quick verse with you, and then we're going to get on with our time of praise. This is from Psalm 100. It's perfect for the morning. Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness, and what we're about to do, come before him with joyful singing. I'm glad you're here. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father. Blessings flow, praise Him, all creatures. 
creatures here below. Praise Him above the heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Lord, we come before Thee now. At Thy feet we Continue in what you have learned and have become convinced of, because you know those from whom you learned it, and how from infancy you have known the holy scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Please be seated. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest spring. But holy trust in Jesus' name. My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but holy trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide His face, In the 
Savior's love through the storm. He is Lord, Lord of all. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless and before the throne, faultless and before the throne. We'll take our offering at this time. Man of sorrows, Lamb of God, by his own betrayed the sin of man and wrath of God has been on Jesus laid. Silent as he stood communion very often or do the communion meditation very often about once a year I like to do it and this past week um, the events of the week just kind of said this is the week that I want to say some words before we share communion this this is a part of our service that folks who, who don't have a, a lot of church background or who have a background in a different church find odd. Um, it's called by different names. It's called the Lord's Supper, which is weird because we do it in the morning. Um, some call it communion, which is weird because it feels very private and individualistic. Um, some churches call it Eucharist, which is, uh, comes from an ancient Greek word that means thanksgiving. That word's found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, where Paul uses the word to describe the night Jesus instituted this ritual and that's what this is a religious rite or ritual uh, sacrament uh, a means of grace and remembrance and it was instituted by Jesus which is why we do it because he started it. But here's what Paul said in first uh, Corinthians 11 23 and 24 I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you that the Lord Jesus on the night he was betrayed took bread and when he had given thanks, and there's that word, Eucharist, when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the next verse, Paul describes how Jesus took a cup of wine and told his disciples that the wine represented his blood. That even if you're accustomed to this ritual, all this talk of bodies and blood is, at the very least, off-putting. And, and even if you're not put off by the implicit violence in the symbols of bread and wine, there, there remains a foreignness, a strangeness in this ritual. So if you're exploring the Christian faith, the ideas behind this can seem extremely inaccessible to you. And even if you're a lifelong Christian, they can feel totally disconnected from real life, like this is just not connected to anything we ever do in real life, which is where the events of last week 
intersect here. Um, I think we have more access and connection to the reality beneath this ritual than we imagine. This past week, we held a funeral service here in this room for little Eli Wilder. For months, he and others fought really hard. And he won hearts all over the country. But he was unable to overcome the brokenness he was born with. And it was sad and it was sweet. It was hard. And then also this past week, another one of our members, John Box, John and Lynn are here this morning. Um, John was diagnosed with a mass in his brain. And doctors are still trying to discern its pathology and an effective treatment protocol. And they're in such good spirits and have such great faith. But this was really crushing news, especially given the fact that John retired a couple of weeks ago and they were looking forward to this new stage in life. And then I know some of our members have lost loved ones. Bud Hall lost his brother and Cabot Cooper lost his dad. And there's so many others of us that are struggling with chronic illnesses. Brian and Megan and Hayes and Lynn and Wayne and Farah and Steve. Then there's so many of our older members who are experiencing the breakdown of bodies that were once reliable and strong. And maybe you're thinking about now somebody you lost you love them and, and they passed away. Or you're thinking about the struggle somebody else you love is having, the physical struggle they're having, or the one you're having, or the financial struggle, or the relational thing that you're battling. If you're thinking about that, then that's your access into this ritual. Like you, or like the people you love, Jesus suffered in his body. He can identify with the pain you feel, the way death and loss and sickness and relational struggle and divorce and financial problems, he can identify with the way those things make us feel separated and isolated and alone and forsaken. He understands the temptation to give in, to give up, to question God. And so when we take this, this pinch of bread and we drink that little swill of wine, we remember what he endured and why. But see, the truth is we may never know the reasons we or those we love suffer in our bodies, but we know why he suffered. He suffered to make us right with God. And that's not all there is to the story, but that's enough for now. Let's pray. God, we come to you this morning um, some of us in deep pain, a deep physical pain. Uh, some of us are listening online and we're not even in this room, but we are in this moment and we are in pain. And we pray that we could use that pain to access the meaning of this ritual and the memory of what Jesus did on the cross. Some of us are in deep pain because we lost someone we loved. And we feel that separation. We pray that we can use that separation to access this moment and to remember the cross because on the cross, Jesus cried out, why have you forsaken me? God, it is through our pain that we often find you. It is in our pain you often find us. And so as we share this bread, we remember that it was through pain that you made a way for us to come home. In his name we pray, amen.
sin of heaven, God's own Son, to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Now my dead is faith. It is paid in full by the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed. Now my debt is paid, it is paid. By the precious blood that my Jesus spilled, now the curse of sin has no hold on me, whom the Son sets free, oh, is free indeed, oh, that rugged cross by salvation. Praise and honor unto Thee. See, the stone is rolled away. Behold the empty tomb. My salvation, when your love poured out over me, now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee, praise and honor. faith to embrace the hope of the empty tomb that you conquered death by dying and then by rising from the dead is phenomenal hope almost and sometimes too too hopeful to believe maybe if we remember that you were willing to shed the blood of your son to save us from our sins. And if you had that much love, you've got that much power to set us free from all the things that kill us. So thank you for this cup, this reminder of how far you were willing to go to say you love us. In his name we pray, amen.
my heart, my mind, my body, my soul, I same time so we got to practice more yeah mm-hmm. so. hey um, I don't know if you keep up with international news or not uh, but if you do you have probably been reading about um, the strife that's going on down in Quito Ecuador we have um, a mission down there that is really important to this church we go down there a lot uh, they come up here a lot uh, it's a place called Hacienda of Hope It's a home for uh, abused and neglected children and a school called the School of Hope. 
and got about 40 kids and many staff members down there that we love and care about and pray for and give money to and go down and visit and they come up here and live with us and it's really important to us and so we've been concerned about the rioting going on in Ecuador. Um, so it's a kind of a mess. It involves the International Monetary Fund and the, the president of Ecuador cut off uh, government uh, support and funding for uh, gasoline prices and it's just a mess. Um, We've heard from our team down there, they tell us that they're doing fine, that uh, most of the unrest is uh, about an hour away in Quito, the capital city, and they're doing okay, they're well supplied, they got what they need, but they do want us and we must keep them in our prayers. So be praying for the peace in Ecuador. And it's just it's a great example of how stuff that's going on politically and um, internationally and economically can, can impact the work of Christ anywhere, but it's also an opportunity for the work of Christ to impact all that. So keep those folks in your prayers. Um, we'll talk about that as we get more news. So there was this minister who decided that a visual demonstration would add emphasis to his Sunday sermon. You ever seen that happen before? So four words. He took. He didn't use. Last week we used crayons. This guy thought it would be interesting to use worms. So he, he, he took four worms and he placed the four worms into four different jars on the stage. One jar was full of alcohol, he dropped a worm down into the alcohol. One was full of cigarette smoke. I'm not sure how he got the cigarette smoke in there, but there was a jar full of cigarette smoke, dropped a worm down in that. Jar number three was full of chocolate syrup, dropped a worm down in that. And jar number four was just good, clean soil. And then he preached his sermon. At the end of his sermon, he said, now we're going to see how our worms fared. So he went over to the jar of alcohol, pulled out the worm, dead. Jar of cigarette smoke, dead. Jar of chocolate syrup, dead. Good soil, pulled out the worm, and the worm was just happy as he could be, happiest worm in the world. And then the preacher said, all right, church, what lesson do you learn from this demonstration? And this old lady in the back raised her hand and said, as long as you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you won't have worms. So... Hey, Balcony, thank you guys. You guys laughed best of all. Okay. These people down here didn't get that. You know why? It's probably because they drink, smoke, and eat chocolate. That's what I'm going to say. <laughs> Do you ever feel like the message you're trying to communicate is not the message people are getting? Like the, we have kind of a, I started to title this sermon Cool Hand Luke because Luke wrote the book of Acts. I thought that would be kind of cool. Cool Hand Luke. And it's about what we have here is a failure to communicate, right? That happens sometimes when we're trying to get a message out to people. The message you thought you were sending is not the message people are getting, or the message you sent is not really the message people needed. You ever get that? There's a story in Acts chapter 5, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts, the fifth book in the New Testament. We're in a series called Vintage Church. We're, we're looking back at the history book of the New Testament, the book of Acts, learning from our ancestors in the faith, the things they did right, the things they did wrong. And it's a little bit of a mixed bag this morning. It was some right and some wrong in Acts chapter 5. But it has to do with how we communicate, the message that we're sending. So I want to read the passage with you. It's in uh, Acts chapter 5. I'll begin at verse... 14, and we're going to read all the way down. It's kind of a long reading, down to verse 28. So here we go. Hang with me. Nevertheless, more and more men and women believed in the Lord and were added to their number. So the church is growing. That's good news. As a result, people brought the sick into the streets and laid them on beds and mats so that at least Peter's shadow might fall on some of them as he passed by. Crowds gathered also from the towns around Jerusalem, bringing their sick and those tormented by impure spirits, demons. And all of them were healed. Then the high priest and all his associates, who were members of the party of the Sadducees, were filled with jealousy. They arrested the apostles and put them in the public jail. But during the night... An angel of the Lord opened the doors to the jail and brought them out. 
This is verse 20. We'll come back to this verse. Put a finger on it, underline it, highlight it. Go stand in the temple courts, the angel said, and tell the people all about this new life. At daybreak, the apostles entered the temple courts as they'd been told, and they began to teach. When the high priest and his associates arrived, they called together the Sanhedrin. That's the ruling council of the Jews. It was made up of Pharisees and Sadducees, the two major parties of Israel. The full assembly of the elders of Israel and sent to the jail for the apostles. But on arriving at the jail, the officers did not find them there. And so they went back and reported, we found the jail securely locked with the guards standing at the doors. But when we opened the doors, we found no one inside. On hearing this report, the captain of the temple guard and the chief priests were at a loss wondering what this might lead to. Then someone came and said, look, the men you put in jail are standing in the temple teaching the people. At that, the captain went with his officers and brought the apostles. They did not use force because they feared the people might stone them. The apostles were brought in and made to appear before the Sanhedrin to be questioned by the high priest. We gave you strict orders not to teach in this name, he said, and yet you have filled Jerusalem with your teaching and are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. And the story goes on where Peter tells the high priest, look, you, you're putting us in a bind here because it's either obey you or obey God. And I just got to tell you, Mr. High Priest, sir, we're going to obey God, not you. So what, what message was God trying to send by the apostles? The answer to that question depends on who you ask. Because if, you, if you're one of the people in the temple, the apostles are messengers of compassion. See, the reason all of these people are coming to the temple for healing is because earlier in the story, Peter and John had healed a man who had been disabled for four decades, 40 years. He'd been un unable to walk. And so they heal him, and he's able. He, he goes running through the temple, telling everybody what had happened. So news of his miraculous restoration spreads all through Jerusalem and the countryside, and so people began bringing their sick relatives to the temple, not to, not to beg for money, but to become the next miracle story. The demon-possessed, the impure spirits, People with impure spirits were also brought. I think it's interesting that Luke makes a distinction between physical sicknesses and spiritual sickness. That makes a lot of contemporary scholars and theologians uncomfortable these days. The Bible's embarrassing embrace of demons. And so what a lot of uh, scholars that you, some of you may read sometimes will say, well, really, this was probably a case of some physical sickness that these folks didn't know or understand like, that maybe it was epilepsy or something. Luke was a doctor. He was a physician, the, the, the man who wrote this. And he wrote this by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He knew the difference between a physical sickness and a spiritual sickness, and I suspect some of us do too. Luke is not interested in being patronized. He believed there were demons, and he believed that God could deal with them. At any rate, if you were one of the multitudes in the temple, your answer to the question, what are, what, what's God trying to communicate through these guys? It's all about compassion. It's about helping the people. It's about taking care of the hurting. And you would have been partly right. But if you've been part of the religious hierarchy, the high priest and his buddies, you would have reached an entirely different conclusion. Verse 28, when they confront the apostles, they say, you have filled Jerusalem with this teaching, and you are determined to make us guilty of this man's blood. This man, of course, refers to Jesus. The message they heard was one of condemnation, and they too were partly right. Two very different responses to the same message it was either all about compassion or it was all about condemnation. Last week, we observed this, diversity is hard. We all kind of long for this uh, mountaintop scene like they have in those old Coca-Cola commercials where everybody's drinking Coke and singing in perfect harmony, and, and that looks good and sounds good, and it's, it's aspirational, but it's also really, really hard. Diversity is hard, but so is communication. 
Communication is really hard. That's why verse 20 is such a critical verse here. When the angel opened the doors to the prison in which the apostles had been incarcerated, he gave them this command, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people all about this new life. Tell the people all of it. You know, there are different translations, different versions of the ancient scriptures. There's the King James Version, which was written in 1611, translated in 1611. It's, it's, it translates this, this passage this way. Tell the people all the words of this new life. Same with the English Standard Version. Eugene Peterson, the late Eugene Peterson, did a paraphrase of the Bible, kind of translated it and gave the meaning of it. His is called the message. It goes like this. Tell the people everything there is to say about this life. So last week we learned that inclusive, inclusivity was a core value of the vintage church. They, they wanted to include everybody. We don't get to pick and choose who gets to be one of God's children. God loves all the crayons in the box. He loves all the paint on the palette. He doesn't have a favorite color. This week, the lesson is that the message needs to include everything. We don't get to pick and choose what we believe, what we preach, what we teach, what we tell. If we're going to faithfully communicate God's message to people, then we got to tell all of it. It's not a cafeteria where you go through the line and, and get what you want. You take it all. Not just fragments, not just fractions, not just your favorite parts. Now, if you're not sure about Christianity, here's where this really intersects with your life. If, if you're curious enough to explore it, to consider it, first of all, man, I'm so glad you're here. It says, it says a lot of really good things about you. You're open. If you decide that Christianity is not for you, that you just, I just don't think I like that. Can I just ask you to be sure that you're hearing the whole story? Be sure that you're not rejecting a version of Christianity that's not the real thing. Be sure you hear it all. Don't walk away from the message of what God has done through Jesus until you're sure you've heard the whole story. I've known too many people, I've loved too many people, who heard a part of the story they didn't like and they rejected it, but they hadn't heard the whole story. And then for us, if you're a, if you're a Christian, if you're church, we, we need to be sure we're telling people everything there is to say about this new life. Not just the parts we like, we gotta tell them all of it. Let's think a minute about what, what, how that looks. In, in what ways do we sometimes proclaim a partial, fragmented message? In what ways maybe have you heard a partial or fragmented message? Well, one, of, one is that I think sometimes Christians emphasize only the moral teaching of Jesus. Je Jesus did speak about morality. He preached about adultery and lust and murder and hate and materialism and greed and theft and envy. He did all the sexual and material sins. He covered that. A couple of things here, though. That's not all he taught. And the morality he taught wasn't really new. Judaism had been, been proclaiming personal holiness for centuries. In fact, a, a lot of people in Greek and Roman culture were attracted to Judaism because they knew how rotten and immoral to the core their culture was. And Judaism, the religion of the Jews, had this kind of moral center. They were, they were certain about some things, and a lot of people were attracted to that. It's absolutely true that Jesus deepened. He took, he took the idea of, of moral living deeper down to the heart level. But, but what he said, the, 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 the morality that he preached was not all that new. It was pretty old. In fact, there was a... There was a group of Pharisees. The Pharisees was like the strictest group of the Jews. They were like uh, Navy SEAL Jews. They were like really serious. There was a segment within them called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees. And they were called, the, it was a joke. They were called the bruised and bleeding Pharisees because when they were walking down the street and they saw a woman, they would close their eyes and they would often run into things or fall. And so they were bruised and bleeding because they were trying so hard to be 
pure and moral. Um, so Jesus preached morality, but that wasn't entirely new, and it's not all he talked about. And if it's all we talk about, and if, it's all, if you're just kind of kicking the tires and it's all you're hearing, if, if all we talk about is how immoral people are these days, if all we do is condemn the sexual and material sins of our community, we are preaching a, and proclaiming a partial message. If you're considering walking away from Christianity because you think all they ever do is moralize, I hope you'll stay long enough to hear the rest of it because that's not all we do. That's not all he said. Some Christians think that, that really what we need to talk about mostly or focus on mostly are the rituals, the, 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 the rituals. Jesus thought ritual was important. He submitted to baptism. Baptism is, there's a, a, behind me here, there's a pool. And in that pool is about three or four feet of water. And when people are ready to give their lives to Christ, they're ready to follow him, we perform a ritual called baptism, which we immerse people in that water and we, we bring you up. We don't leave you down there. Depending on who you are, sometimes we leave you down longer, right? We bring you up, and it's a reenactment of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus. That's a ritual, but Jesus submitted to that. He instituted the Lord's Supper, this, this ritual that we did a little bit earlier in the service, but neither of those was, was a new thing either. The Jews practiced baptism as a rite of passage long before Jesus commanded it. And the Lord's Supper has its roots in the Jewish Passover. Of course, those rituals were invested with new meaning by Jesus, but they themselves were not new. And that's not all he talked about. Christians who focus mainly on the rituals, who think that's the most important thing, are kind of like an engaged couple who worries only about the wedding ceremony but doesn't spend any time preparing for the marriage. The substance of the faith is way more important than the symbols. The foundation is way more important than the figure, and it must pain the heart of God to know that Christians have divided up based on how they perform those rituals. Come on. We proclaim a partial message rather than the full message of this new life if we convey to people that it's all or only or even mostly about the rituals. And if you're turned off by Christianity's rituals, I get that. The Lord's Supper is weird. Talk of blood and body and bread and wine is unsettling, but there's something important and beautiful and significant beneath these strange rituals. I hope you'll be willing to explore the substance behind the symbols before you walk away from it. And then sometimes all we want to talk about is the church. And if this were like, if we were maybe Presbyterian, I would say, sometimes all we want to talk about is ecclesiology, right? The ecclesiology is teaching about the church. I say that because Presbyterians are generally smarter than we are because I love them. Jesus did declare that he would build his church. He did talk about the church. The apostles wrote lots of letters describing how the church might be organized, led and taught, the, its functions, the roles within it, its governance, its mission, its worship. But Jesus himself said next to nothing about the structure of the church. He spoke constantly about the life and the relationships of its members. Besides, the message isn't about us. It's not about the church. It's about Jesus. Paul told the Corinthians, when I, when I came to you, brothers and sisters, I didn't come with eloquence or superior wisdom when I proclaim to you the testimony about God, for I resolved to know nothing while I was among you except Jesus Christ and him crucified. If our message is primarily one about how to do church, if it's primarily about us, we're not telling people the full message of this new life. And then there are Christians who are mostly concerned about the injustice they see in the world. They see the transformation of an unjust society as holy a task as confronting moral sin or maintaining sound orthodoxy. If they rewrote, if these Christians rewrote the parable of the Good Samaritan, he would not only bind up the wounds of the man who'd been beaten and robbed and left for dead, he'd set up a committee to install, install better lighting on that road. And he would recruit people to protest at Herod's palace for better police protection for travelers. There is, of course, a social justice component to the message of Jesus. He taught his disciples to pray, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth, even as it is done in heaven. But he also said, my kingdom is not of this world. 
We proclaim a fragmented message anytime we emphasize one part of the Christian experience over all the others or to the exclusion of others. Some Christians make it all about praise and worship. Some focus tightly on the work of the Holy Spirit. Some on the reliability of Scripture or the protection and maintenance of tradition. Still others can talk mainly of correct do doctrine and teaching or sound doctrine and social justice. I doubt the angel who opened the prison doors for the apostles thought they had overemphasized compassion. He did not, however, tell them to go back in the temple courts, take their stand, and start healing again. He said, go stand in the temple courts and tell the people the full message of this new life. What we need here is balance. There's a great Old Testament passage about this, Micah 6, 8. If you don't know this, you should, this one you, you need to get. He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. Mercy, justice, humility, balance. We recently witnessed a beautiful illustration of this. Last year, a Dallas police officer, Dallas, Texas police officer, who thought she was entering her own apartment, shot and killed a young man named Botham Jean. It wasn't her apartment, it was his. This guy was sitting on his couch, eating ice cream, watching TV. And she walked in and shot him, killed him. Last week, the officer, Amber Geiger, was sentenced to 10 years in prison. During the victim impact statements, Botham's 18-year-old brother, Brant, shocked the courtroom by not only extending forgiveness to his brother's killer, but asking for and receiving permission to get up walk across the room and embrace his brother's killer in a hug. His profound act of mercy went viral. Moments like that blow us away. And we've seen them before when Reginald Denny forgave the young men who beat him nearly to death during the L.A. riots in 1992, or a woman named Mandy Bass of Melbourne, Florida, who advocated for a reduced sentence for the young man who entered her home and beat her half to death, or the Amish community in Nickel Mines, Pennsylvania, who reached out with grace to the family of the man who shot and killed five little girls at the Amish school. We're, every time we see something like that, we're just blown away by the mercy and forgiveness that is, that is extended, that superhuman mercy and forgiveness that we think, I could never do that. But if that's all we see, if that's all we focus on, if that's all we talk about is the mercy, then something gets lost. Justice. That's why the statement from Botham Jean's mother was so important. Like her son, Brant, she offered forgiveness, but she confronted the city of Dallas with a call for justice. Amber Geiger needed mercy, but in order for the value of his life to be accounted for and the offense against him acknowledged, Botham Jean needed justice. Where there is no mercy, justice is cruel. And where there is no justice, mercy is cheap. That's why we have to tell the whole story. Not just the parts that comfort us. Not just the parts that confront others. We've got to tell it all. You're not going to like some of it either. I don't like some of it. This has offended audiences in, in churches that I've spoken to before. I may have said it here. I don't remember. But there are parts of the Bible that I really don't agree with. It's right and I'm wrong, but I don't like it. Are we, do we really think that we are going to agree with everything God says to us? He said, my thoughts are higher than your thoughts and my ways are higher than your ways. He said that to the Old Testament prophets. If it was true of them, it's true of us. We are not going to agree with everything we read in Scripture. If you're not a Christian and you're kicking the tires on this faith, I'm going to tell you right now, there's stuff in that book that's going to set your hair on fire. You're going to hate it. This book, this Bible, this Word of God, in many ways is against you and me but it's against us because it's for us.
We, are, we need to be challenged. I need to be confronted. I need to be told the truth about the things I value and the actions I take and the steps I, the things I prioritize. I need somebody outside of me to say there's a better way. And that's what God's word does for us. And that's why we have to embrace the whole message. Look, Jesus didn't come with a message about a new set of rituals. He did not come to proclaim a new way of organizing religious people. He did not come to talk about a new way of worship. He didn't die to establish a new set of rules. He had every opportunity and the power to overthrow the oppressive regime of Caesar and establish a more just government, but that's not what he did. He came to demonstrate and die for a new way of living. That new way of living will include some new rituals. It will include new religious arrangements, new ways of worship, new healthier ways of relating to God and other people. It will involve opposition to oppressive powers and commitments to improving the lives of people on the margins. It will include justice. It will include mercy. But at its core, the message is about a new life, a new way of living, one that finds meaning not in success, but in service. One that finds purpose not in conquest, but in surrender. One that finds fulfillment not in actualizing myself, but in acquiescing to the will of a God who rarely agrees with me. That'll be hard. But we want a new life, right? You don't get a new life living the old way. Listen to the whole message. Believe the whole message. Live the whole message. Let's stand. Let's sing together. Precious cornerstone, sure foundation, you are faithful to the end. We are waiting on you, Jesus. We believe you're all to us. Let the glory of your name be the passion of the church. Let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns. Let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives. We believe you're all to us. Only Son of God, sin from heaven, hope and mercy at the cross. You are everything, you're the the glory of your name be the passion of the church let the righteousness of God be a holy flame that burns let the saving love of Christ be the measure of our lives we believe you're all to us you're
They might come on up. A couple of announcements here real quick. Prayer request cards are in the lobbies. Pick one of these up, fill them out, turn them into the office. We are going to be having a prayer service uh, November 1st. And we're, we're, going to, we're going to pray about the stuff you put on this card. So whatever it is, put it on there. Uh, also pick up one of our Second Harvest brochures. Uh, that's a, an event we do every year where we provide meals for people, Thanksgiving meals for people who can't afford them. And you can pick up invitations to that in this lobby over here. We're trying to reach out to people that we have connections with this year more so than in the past. So if you know a family that needs that, pick up an invitation card, register it, take it out, talk to them about it, and bring it back. Here's a brochure that can tell you more about uh, how you can help with that. Ladies, uh, be sure and check out the bulletin note. There is a mini retreat for you guys coming up uh, November 3rd. And be thinking about our, tr our annual trunk and treat as well. That's coming up pretty soon where we put our cars out here, decorate them up, and all kind of cool stuff. And then we bring candy and we reach out to kids in the community. So, hey, glad you were here today. Mike has our closing prayer. Buckle up. I'm, I'm grateful for Jody's uh, sermon today uh, about needing all of Scripture, all of the teachings, not just, just what we want. Um, and I think that kind of message is uh, vital today, especially in a world where um, truth is relative or is being seen as relative. I think we should close in prayer that'll uh, compel us to, uh, to accept that or affirm it. Um, but before we pray, I'd like to read just a little bit of scripture, if that's okay. Uh, I'm going to read from uh, one verse from uh, Matthew chapter 12, and then I'll read a bit from uh, Corinthians. So this is uh, Matthew chapter 12, uh, verse 40. For Jonah was three days and three nights in the belly of the sea monster. So will the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. So why is this verse important? Do we really believe that a person was in the belly of a fish or a whale for multiple days? Or is this just some kind of a fable, a story, trying to make a point? If we equivocate on the validity of Scripture about Jonah, then when does our compromise of the truth of Scripture stop? Jesus himself here just draws the analogy between Jonah in the whale or the fish and his own death, burial, and resurrection. The point is that if Jonah's Scripture is just a fable, then what prevents Jesus' death and resurrection from being the same? I don't know. Maybe you think you're okay with that. But before we do that, I'm going to read uh, one more piece of Scripture. And it's going to explain the folly of attributing his death and resurrection to being a fable. So this is uh, 1 Corinthians 15. And just read a few verses uh, in, in verse 3. Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, to the scriptures which are true. And then he was buried and he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures. Then I'll skip down to uh, 13 where he talks about the consequences of this. If Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. Moreover, it gets even worse, right? Moreover, we are even found to be false witnesses of God because we testified against God that he raised Christ. And then I'll just skip a little bit further down to 17. If Christ has not been raised, then your faith is worthless. You are still in your sins. And those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If we have hoped in Christ in this life only, we are all most to be pitied. Okay.
Sorry, that was, that was tough, so uh, let's pray about it. God, this is your word, and uh, like Jody said, uh, your ways are far above our ways, God, as far as the heavens are above the earth. Uh, and, and God, we can't always understand it, but that's not what we're called to do. We're just called to believe it is true because it is, wor it is your word and you are true. Otherwise, we are to be pitied amongst uh, the most of all people, God, because we're still in our sins and we have no hope. If your word is not true, if Jesus' life and death and resurrection are not true. God, we just pray uh, for our faith, our trust, and uh, somehow also to balance that when we share that with others, to meet them where they are. Uh, I know that, that I struggle with your word at times, and, and other new believers must struggle too, Lord. So help us to have compassion and yet be faithful. We pray this uh, in the name of God the Father, um, and we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ, who's his only begotten Son, who is also God. And uh, we pray this in the name of the Holy Spirit, who was, uh, he was there at Genesis uh, over the water of creation. Uh, he was there thousands of years later, not millions, but thousands of years later at Jesus' uh, baptism, and he's here now in this church. We prayed in his name too, the Holy Spirit's name. Amen.